Hi everybody, welcome to the next episodes of CXO Focus podcast. I have a very special guest, Paul Beck, with me today. He is the Chief Compliance Officer of Contig Bank and he has done a mind-boggling career change from being a Marine, thank you for your service, Paul, to become a Chief Compliance Officer. So I'm very excited to get into his journey. So without any further delay, let me welcome Paul to the call. Hello, Paul. Can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Jay. Yeah, as you said, my name is Paul Bate. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer at Quantic Bank, which is a digital bank based out of New York City. I came to Quantic after a five-year career with First Technology Federal Credit Union. And from there was seven years with the FDIC as a compliance examiner. And then obviously, as you said, I was nine years in the United States Marine Corps. Wow. And that is something very unusual I have seen. And we all know it is very difficult to do a career change. And that is something I really wanted to ask you as my first question. How did you manage to get such a big career change? Tell us about your journey. I'm sure it's not been easy, but I think that's where the learnings come from. The funny thing about my career and how it happened was that it didn't go according to the plan. I had gotten out of the Marine Corps and I was actually going to go into a law enforcement career. I put in an application with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I had a couple of friends who became special agents and that didn't work out. I couldn't pass the vision test as I was then moving on to a different goal, which was to be a law enforcement officer with a local agency. I got a job as essentially a part-time teller at a bank. As life happens to happen, by the time I finally was given an offer from a police department, I was pretty far into my career. I had a wife, I had one kid with another one on the way. And so I just decided that I needed to do this. And I transitioned from retail into compliance with a regional bank up here in the Pacific Northwest. And that's where it started. I realized that I definitely had a knack for compliance. And I think it was because I was a compliance officer, but I had existed up to that point on the retail side of things. I could speak as a compliance officer, but I also knew the real challenges that mortgage lenders and deposit officers and operations supervisors had. So that's how I ended up here. Great, great. I think in our last conversation, you did mention, and you are a perfect example of this, is that just hard work is not enough. It has to be directed. Can you please put more light on that? This is something that a lot of the people that I mentor now ask me about. And the thing that I usually tell them, I said, effort is like driving a car and the effort is the gas pedal, right? And there's a lot of times when people think just the harder I push the gas pedal, the more successful I'll be. But without looking outside, that's great if it's a flat, straight road with no traffic. But we all know life is rarely like that. And so you have to focus on the journey. And also there's a lot of people that I talk to when we work on things and they realize that I'm working hard and putting in all this effort and then using the same analogy, I'll say, yeah, but you're in a muddy field and you're making a lot of noise and the wheels are spinning like crazy, but you're not moving forward. So effort is fine, but if it's not directed and it's not focused, and if you don't know where you want to end up then all that effort is just displaced. And again, you're working very hard and not getting anywhere. Yeah, and so you need a very directed hard work, right? Into your journey. Can you tell me how exactly from a Marine to and Chief Compliance Officer you reached? When I decided to go into compliance and that was going to be the focus of my career, I first leveraged a lot of the things I learned in the Marine Corps about leadership and focus and direction. And I focused on what we call the the leadership traits, taking care of my people, making sure that everybody was informed, being transparent. Those types of things that I learned from a leadership point of view in the Marine Corps is what I took with me into my career. The other thing that I did personally was figured out where I wanted to be. If I wanted to end up being a chief compliance officer, then the next question is, okay, what all do you need to know? That is where the journey took me from being a compliance officer at a bank to taking time and getting a job with the FDIC as a field examiner. Because again, part of my plan was if I want to be a chief compliance officer, I'm going to have to deal with regulatory examiners all the time. I need to know what they know and what they're looking for and how they do things that's going to make me better. 
I spent seven years as a field examiner with the Division of Consumer Protection at the FDIC. I examined, I think the count was around 67 different institutions. It gave me real life examples of well-run institutions, poorly run institutions in transition from poor to good, from good to poor. I've seen it all. Also know how examiners think and what they're looking for. Then the other thing I did is I went through the Pacific Coast Banking School program that was a three-year graduate program in banking because I know about compliance and I know about retail. And if you do that, you tend to think that banking, that's all it is. You only think of your world. Pacific Coast Banking School gave me exposure to all aspects of banking. There really wasn't an area that wasn't touched. And that's when I really started to realize that for as long as I've been in banking, I don't know as much as I thought I did. And so... It was another skill set that I added to what I had. I think that's important. If you want to be successful in your career, obviously you have to know your discipline very well. But if you don't know how it fits with all the other disciplines, you're just making your life harder. You can be successful, but boy, there's a lot of wasted effort and time. In getting here, I wanted to make sure that I had all the pieces in place. And it was a methodical journey. It was very specific what I wanted and little check boxes that I had to deal with before I got here. And it's worked out well. Absolutely. You went, you changed the job to take a field service job to really understand how the compliance people do compliance. You went to a school to really actually learn more, right? And obviously you bring a lot of discipline and leadership skills from Marine Corps. So you combined all those things, created a map and a journey and where you are. It's very impressive. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now, in your current role, the next question would be, uh, what strategies are you using as a compliance officer? Because compliance is becoming harder and harder and with so much of fraud, with so much of AI coming into picture, right? It's very hard to now detect whether this is fake or this is real, right? Is this AI created or this is not? What strategies are you using as a compliance officer to make sure you stay compliant? There's a number of things. First is that leveraging technology is really important. And so even though you may leverage a certain platform, you should always be looking at other platforms. You can't get overcommitted to one thing because the fact of the matter is just like you said, with the advent of AI, with the efficiencies gained in institutions by opening accounts with people that you never actually see physically, the potential for fraud is always there. And the problem with finding a solution and sticking with that solution and thinking, this is great, we're not doing anything else, is that the bad guys, they adjust too, right? They're doing the same thing. They're figuring out where the weaknesses are. And if they keep hitting a brick wall, they're going to go look for different ones. You have to do the same thing. So I think that's one thing that we do constantly is We're leveraging what we have to the maximum degree we can, but we're also constantly looking for other platforms and other modules, even within our own platform, as we're keeping an eye on what essentially the bad guys are doing. When I talk to boards of directors and leaders, I usually use the analogy that this job is like running up an escalator the wrong way right? You can get to the top, but the moment you stop and rest, you're going to slide back down. So you have to constantly be moving, right? You cannot, you just can't stop. And if you think you can just find the perfect solution and that's it, you're going to end up getting exploited. Oh yeah. That's such a great analogy. Compliance is a continuous thing. You have to keep doing it. You have to keep in front of the technology because bad guys are doing the same thing. And that brings me to the next question. What technologies do you guys use and what's the future roadmap on technology front? So if you were to bifurcate it into the compliance side and the financial crime side, fraud and anti-money laundering, we use a number of things. We use Verifin, obviously, which is our main platform, but then we're always looking for other things. There are some really good technologies relative to monitoring what the person on the other side is doing, monitoring keystrokes and how they use their mouse And you can tell whether they're left-handed or right-handed and things like that. So that if somebody says, hey, this is Jay signing in and I've got the password and I've got the username, but when I'm typing stuff, common misspellings that are just common to me, just Mm -hmm. how I do things, if we're not seeing that, it will send an alert saying, hey, we don't think this is really Jay, which will allow us to reach out. 
that's relatively new. And I know AI is one of these things. It can be used for good and also it can be used for evil, right? But for us, we're doing it to let us know that we don't think this is right. And now we can focus. That's where you can introduce the human element, which is we can focus and say, hey, there's some guy trying to access Jay's account saying he's Jay, but we don't think he's Jay. Let's get the person involved in the process, right? And so leveraging technology is great, but if you just rely solely on technology, I think that's just an area for exploitation. On the compliance side, the way I have set up my division is that obviously we're checking to make sure we're following the rules, right? That's basic to every institution out there. But the other thing that we do is we have people, and I'm one of them, that's dedicated to reading reports, public reports of review, right? When regulators do exams, some of the stuff, especially enforcement actions, are public. So I can read enforcement actions and pick up trends, and I can say, hey, this regulatory agency has suddenly gotten really focused on flood violations because we're seeing all of a sudden an increase in sanctions for flood violations. So it's something we need to pay attention to. We also do a lot of reading regulatory, their press releases. It tells us where regulators are focused and they will tend to get focused on things because they see trends that obviously aren't public. But you can tell from their public statements and their public enforcement actions where they're focused in, which, again, the best way to put it is it gives us intelligence, right? It's intelligence gathering. It's no different than going back to my time in the military. It's no different. You've got to figure out what people are up to. And that allows us to then shore up those areas because we can say, hey, all of a sudden we've seen an uptick in this area and we've seen the regulators are really focused on this area. I think just as timing has it, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank is we're really monitoring everything that the regulators and the analysts are saying about that, because that's going to tell us, are we paying attention to those areas that caused that failure? When it comes to compliance, there's the basic, these are the rules we got to follow them, but then there's also the forward-looking aspect. And if you don't have that forward-looking aspect in your compliance management system plan, then I think you're missing something. Yeah, technology has really held together with business, right? It's no more technology separate and business process and business separate, right? As a next question of mine, how do you see business leaders being technology savvy? There is a need for that as everybody sees it. But question really is how do they become technology savvy? How do they remain technology savvy? That's an interesting question because especially when you're talking to leaders, a lot of leaders are in their heart of hearts entrepreneurs, right? Mm. And so they tend to want to be on the leading edge of technology. They want to find that thing that nobody else is doing. That creates an opportunity for new technology to be placed in front of them. The problem is sometimes they get focused on the shiny new thing and they want to rush it in because again, they don't want to be a fast follower. They want to be a technology leader. And that's where I come in right? That's where my group comes in because we have to first make sure it's as shiny as they're claiming it is too. Does it essentially do what our other technologies already do, maybe in a less flashy form, but we do it. What are we gaining out of this? And so I think in answer to your question, the best thing that you can do from a person in my position is to manage expectations, is to take a realistic look at the technology and ask that big question, which is what ultimately is this thing going to do that our current systems don't? And is it worth the expense of implementing and changing over and all the integration costs, right? All those baseline costs that are not going to change. And it really is. Sometimes it's very hard to explain to people that, yes, it looks better, it feels better, it's flashier, but this thing doesn't do anything that our current technology doesn't already do or doesn't have the capability of doing. We just haven't turned on the switch yet. Yeah, and I think it's the perfect recent example in the market is about Microsoft enabling chat GPT inside their Bing search. They just went through it. They wanted to be a technology leader. They want to be in the forefront. And it caused a lot of problems, right? They had to scale it down, bring it back because people started using it in an evil way first, then in a good way, right? So that is where your role really comes into play. You said it very rightly. 
I think I see a good example is cell phones, right? Whether you're an Apple or an Android person, when the new version of your phone comes out, there's a line out the door to buy it. And a lot of times people don't ask themselves, what does this new phone do that my current phone doesn't do? And sometimes the thing that it does is only this much better. And you've got to ask yourself, is it worth what you're going to pay for it? And look, technology in the financial sector is the same. There's a lot of flashy products out there. And if you're not asking the questions about what does mine currently do? What is this going to give me? Where's the value there? Then you're just constantly making changes for the sake of making changes. So that's absolutely a very good example you gave about cell phones. The other question I had for you, Paul, was a lot of things have changed, especially after COVID, right? What are some of the best practices that were there prior to COVID, prior to these technologies, which you are dropping and which are you keeping going forward? I think probably the most obvious one is the amount of work that can be done offsite. And I think that's the thing that a lot of companies are struggling with now is they're trying to get people back to the workplace and they're trying to find that balance of, I need people back here so I can continue the culture of my corporation, or was I getting efficiencies on the outside? When it comes to practices that I'm dropping, I think one thing that I've learned over time and that was something that I would probably say a little bit difficult for me to drop was this idea that my people needed to be very knowledgeable about compliance. In other words, could I sit somebody down and give them a test and have them score very well on what the rules are? One thing that I dropped because my staff being so offsite my department was one of the ones that during COVID, we were mandatory work from home. We weren't even allowed to come into the building. Because they were off-site, I had more one-on-one -on -one time. I was calling them and we were talking a lot more. And I started to realize that I can be just as efficient if there's somebody who has an absolute expert knowledge, they know a regulation front and back. Can I be as good as them if I am pretty good? I have an understanding but I don't have the absolute understanding that this person does. The answer is yes, because I can look things up. Just technology has allowed me to the point where I can get an answer to a question that you may already know. I can get it just almost as fast as you. So if that's the case, then where should I be focusing my mentoring and my training and things on? It comes down to this. How good are you as an expert in this field at transferring that knowledge to other people who aren't compliance experts. So in other words, if I have two people and one, again, will always score the highest on the compliance tests, but has a horrible bedside manner, is that person as valuable to me who doesn't know things as quickly, but is able to talk to other areas where compliance isn't their expertise in a way that they understand? In other words, can the people on the front line implement what you're telling them? Yes or no, because that's where the importance is. And if you know everything, but you don't talk to people very well, the people who need to know it because they're the ones implementing it aren't going to have that information because they stop listening to you. Really, for lack of a better term, the less smart person can actually be more valuable to you. And that is one thing that I've learned, focusing on the interpersonal skills rather than the raw knowledge. We have always seen teams win against individuals. You can be as smart as you want to be, but it's always a team effort. And this is a great learning for me as I run my company as well. Don't look for a smart, shiny guy. Look right. for a person who can communicate to the front end, who can figure out things because finding knowledge is very easy nowadays. That is a very good answer. Thank you for your insights. Going forward, you have gone through not just multiple industries, but really multiple departments of how our life works, being a Marine Corps to being a financial advisor at a bank and now being a compliance officer. Based on your experience from various departments, how do you really look at a new technology for business? How do you evaluate it? I would say that, again, if you look at my entire range of experiences, first, let's just look at my banking experience. I've okay. worked for large and small institutions as large as $350 billion, all the way down to banks that were about $600 million, right? From thousands and thousands of employees to less than 200. And one thing that I've learned is technology is going to move. It's going to happen. But at the same time, also have to be very aware that there's good technology and bad technology. 
If we go back to my time in the military, not being technically savvy, not having technology has real world consequences. In the banking world, if you don't leverage technology correctly or often enough, basically you're talking about profits being hit or employment being lost. In the military, it usually translates into people dying. It's much more important. And so what I do today is always with the background of how we brought new technologies and new things into my life in the Marine Corps. It concentrated the realities. You saw them much more quickly. I use that in what I do day to day. So in other words, it's very important that I don't skip any steps. Due diligence is really important. Again, asking those questions that I've already referred to about where do we want to end up with this? How much is it going to cost? And then really doing a good risk analysis. Risk analysis is something that I think when it comes to technology that a lot of people skip because they just tend to think the system will fix whatever it is. Or if we see a problem, we can fix that after we get it up and running. That I have learned from my non-banking life and also my life as a regulatory examiner, that's usually a recipe for disaster. You didn't do enough due diligence. You didn't look at the things. And now you've put all this effort and time and cost into bringing this thing online. And the thing that you thought that you could just fix after it was up and running, you find out, no, you can't fix it. So again, it's like this spiral. Then what do you do? You have to have a workaround for that. And then you have to have controls on that workaround. And then you've got this process that you call an automated process that really, because of the workarounds, is more manual. I am always a big fan of getting that foundation set. I like to utilize new technology. I like looking at new platforms and what they do. I'm a big fan of bringing it on board, but not until it's gone through that due diligence process to make sure that we have all the questions asked and that we've identified all the things that don't seem right and getting answers for them before implementation. So in a nutshell, you're looking at, will this technology kill me? Because you always come from that thing that wrong technology yes. can kill people. It's not about just profits and money and time. It can take somebody's right. life. And I always say the same thing to my customers as well, that let's spend a little more time in discovery and solutioning because implementation is easy. You tell me I can customize any system. I can do anything. I can make anything happen today with technology. But discovering what you want and solutioning it correctly, turning all the stones is very important before we get into implementation. And I got one more perspective saying that, think, is this technology going to kill someone? Go with that attitude, with that seriousness. Yes, exactly. If you go in with that attitude, I think you'll end up seeing things that maybe you weren't willing to look at before, or you were willing to overlook. And I think one thing that I didn't mention that I think is really important is when you're talking about implementing new technology platforms, it's always critical as part of your due diligence process to talk to the people who are going to ultimately be using it. Talk to those frontline people, because that is a step that is often not taken into account. They will tell you things and they will point out things that you never thought of. And answering those questions will pay dividends once it's implemented. Oh, absolutely. We do a lot of Salesforce implementation and we work with a lot of IT teams, right? But we make sure that we get in front of the real users, we get that user feedback, right? before we finalize the requirements. Because many times IT says that, oh, we know what we want. These are our requirements. Can you give us a proposal? Our answer is honestly no, because I would like to have that discovery call with your users and user feedback is extremely important. So thank you for that. One last thing, Paul, with your stature and with your experience and expertise, what advice would you give to other people who are not just trying to become chief compliance officers, but trying to maximize their potential in a career. I always say that you don't have to become a CEO and that's not your success, right? Your success is, am I happy saying that I'm using my potential to the max? Because everybody is at a different level and everybody has different genius in them. So what advice would you give for them to find their genius, make a plan and execute that? I would say that the advice that I always give to the people who I hire who want to aspire to what I'm doing is don't limit yourself to being the expert in this field. Just like I said before, don't limit yourself to knowing everything there is to know about regulatory compliance. 
If you don't know how your puzzle piece that you're creating fits into the rest of it, you're not going to be as successful. Always be open to learning. I am, I hate to always say this, but I'm almost 54 years old. I've been at this for a while and yet I never stop trying to learn new things. I never stop talking to other people. And until the day I retire, I'm going to have that attitude that I don't know everything. I'm always asking the question of myself, what don't I know? What Mm -hmm. should I know more of? And I will be the first to say that I have a reputation for building these really good, solid teams. And a lot of times when I'm asked about that, I always tell them, you've got to hire people who are better than you at specific things right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times you have people who, as they're climbing the ladder, so to speak, they don't realize that the higher you go, the less you should be doing in the trenches. Mm -hmm. That was a lesson that I learned from the Marine Corps because I enlisted in the Marine Corps. So I started out enlisted. I didn't start out as an officer and then I became an officer. And I remember at one point in time, I had just gotten commissioned as an officer. I was a brand new lieutenant and we were out setting up essentially a bivouac and that required setting up these huge tents. And I, having been an NCO, I started to help them. And my commanding officer pulled me aside and said, Lieutenant, you're supposed to be overseeing this. You're supposed to be making sure that tent is getting put up and the chow hall is being put up where it's supposed to be put up and that things are being delivered on time. That's your job, right? You're not supposed to be in there essentially swinging a hammer. And for me, it was one of the greatest lessons I ever had because I realized I've got a new job now, overseeing and not doing. And so therefore the people who are doing are going to be better at that than me, but I have a different job. Just like my commanding officer had a different job, which was not to watch the NCOs build a tent. He was to watch his officers, make sure they were doing what they were doing. And I was one of them. Taken that mentality into everything I do. You could grab anybody randomly out of my staff and I could tell you what they do better than me. Because my job is not to do their job. My job is to keep the lane clear so they can do their job. And that is essentially what my function is. I'm the one who deals with all the things that get in their way. I clear the lane. And if people ask me, do you know how to file a suspicious activity report? Get Mm -hmm. online and get filed. I would say, I have no idea. I couldn't do that if I tried. But I know the people that can. And we always get them filed on time and they're complete. Because I'm making sure that anything that gets in the way of filing that suspicious activity report is cleared. And understand that as you move up, there are certain skills that you are going to have to stop doing because you have a new job. So I would say, again, learning and constantly training on all the things that aren't directly related to your job is one. And two is as you move up, understand that your job function changes. And that your job goes from doing the job to overseeing those that do the job and taking care of them. And I guess thirdly, which kind of leads into this is take care of your people. Always take care of them. Always make sure that they're getting credit for the work they did. Don't take credit for something somebody else did. In board meetings and whatnot, I will always mention that so-and-so did this great analysis and I reviewed it and I'm submitting it and giving them credit and giving them opportunities to get into the spotlight. That is taking care of your people. When you do that, you will be amazed at what they're willing to do for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think in your Marine Corps, you guys say that staying together, we will survive. Similarly, staying together as a team, we will succeed, right? No one individual can really be the hero. Such a great advice. I have not heard this kind of perspective when I ask somebody about a career advice, they always say skills, skills, hard work, hard work, hard work, grind, grind. That are the things we learn, but you gave a very different perspective, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending time with me. Any last words? One, I appreciate you giving me this platform to speak. And I would say that just like I was saying before, it's good to meet you because now I have insight into an area that I'm not as good at knowing. Even today, I've learned something and I will add that to my repertoire as I move forward. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul.